It is Wrestling Observer Radio. Garrett and Dave here on a Friday afternoon, and we have a special guest, Eric McCracken, ma- managing partner of McCaleck and Company. We're going to talk about the Kung Lee and Company and Cajun Johnson and Company versus Zufa lawsuits. Eric, what's going on? Hey, Garrett, nice to meet you. Thanks for thanks for having me on. Just uh, what's going on is, I guess, lots of people talking about <laughs> yeah. this antitrust lawsuit. Big news. Bit, very big news. You know, one of the things um, I was actually there the the, the day it was first announced because it was originally you know filed in San Jose, and you know talked to the lawyers and everything. So, I mean, I, I go back ten years, and my thought is is that like if on that day ten years ago, uh, I would have been told that this lawsuit would be settled for three hundred and thirty five million dollars, I would say, what an incredible number, what an incredible victory, yet. The day it was settled, there was almost a feeling of, is that all? And what does it mean? And I mean, as a as a lawyer who's followed this case very, very closely, I was just kind of wondering, like, what, you know, especially with a couple of days of being able to, to kind of digest it all, what what were your feelings and and um, with, with the settlement and what does this mean, if anything, other than, you know, fighters are going to get you know, a check this year and next year or whatever it's going to be. Yeah, so so I think you put it very well, Dave, which is go back in time 10 years when it was announced and that press conference was held. That was big news. And it it was hard to gauge the merits of the case back then. And you're right. If if anybody said it would settle for $335 million, I think everybody would have been very impressed. Um, I think what maybe changes that reaction for some people over the decade is just how much evidence was um, put out into the public domain from the lawsuit where, where the UFC's business practices, um, you know, you know, a light was really shed on it and just how strong their stranglehold on the sport is. And the fighters talked a lot about bringing structural change to the sport, basically uh, trying to, break up this UFC monopsony, not necessarily break up the company, but just reduce how much power they have over athletes. And I don't know if that if that's going to be achieved by this settlement. The, the one thing I'm not clear on, Dave, is whether the $335 million is all. Financially, I'm sure that's all. I don't think there's another penny there. But are there any other... Um, orders that are going to come in as part of the settlement. So did the UFC agree to reduce their contracts? Are they going to let fighters become free agents more frequently? And I I reached out to Eric Kramer, the lead attorney on this case. I reached out to some of the fighters involved in the case trying to get that information, but every, everybody's being very tight-lipped about it. So they basically say, sit tight for 45 to 60 days. The court filing is going to be made and we'll know more. But we got to wait a couple months to to get the whole story to find out if there's anything else or if it's just the money. But my my um, you know commenting on on the money, John Nash put this out there. He he mentioned this is the fifty first biggest yeah. settlement money wise in U S antitrust history or or in U S class action history. That's yeah. a hell of a good result. Like it, it's yeah. nothing to sneeze at. It's, it's meaningful dollars, but I'd love to see something more come out of it in terms of some structural change to the sport. You know, I mean, one of the, the things it, 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 as far as the money goes, I guess, because the figures that have been running around, I guess they were asking for was it 800 million to 1.6 billion. And then there's the second case. And then you talk about treble damages and people starting to talk about $5 billion and, and these crazy numbers that, that, that are, that, you know, would have been a lot, but the settlement at 335, it's um, I think because those numbers were so big that somehow 335 million, which is a, a giant settlement historically, feels like it's not really that much. And also because 10 years ago, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, $335 million would have been, I would not say disastrous for UFC, but it would have been, I would have said disastrous for UFC. Whereas now, because of the the profit margin, you know, between UFC's profit margin has gone way, way, way up in the last 10 years. And, and now combined with WWE, you know, you even add more to where, 
you know, 335 million is, is essentially, I mean, it's a year, it's a year's worth of profits. It's a lot of money, but um, it's money that the company can afford and keep doing business without, um, you know, I mean, like it's, it's more than a slap in the wrist, but it's not anything that will um, scare them to death either, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. You know, again, yeah. To pretend 335 million is not a lot is nuts, but, but you're right. It's all relative. It's such a behemoth of a company. They could take this hit very easily. And, right. and now, especially if there's no structural change that comes out of it, what you basically get is no harm, no foul for all of this, their business practices going back to 2010 all the way to the present date because the Johnson case is caught up in this. And now you've got current fighters under the roster signing contracts saying they won't participate in class action lawsuits moving forward. So so they've really insulated themselves. I mean, the UFC has always been good at business. And this settlement, if if it gets approved by the courts, is very good for business. The stock market liked it immediately, right? The second the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's no there's no scariness anymore. There, you know, yeah. if the thing had gone to trial and which I never thought it would, but if the thing had gone to trial, if you're an investor in the company and you see these numbers in the billions, that's a very scary trial. This takes all the it's like we we know what we know the number is. We know it's a number that that can be afforded because these companies are ridiculously profitable. And it's like, OK, I mean, it's a, it's a hit, but it's um, but it's not as scary as as many thought it would be, I guess. And certainly in the stock market. I mean, that's why the that it went up and everybody, you know, all the analysts basically viewed it as, OK, you know, it's settled now. Thank God it's settled. This 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 scary lawsuit is and it was a scary lawsuit is, is out of the way because so much had come out, you know, like you said, over the years where this lawsuit, when it first was filed, I was like, I'm not even sure. You know, you know, like I, I can can legally I mean, the idea that let's say the fighters are getting, let's say, 17 percent of the revenue, um, you know, which obviously is far less than than many sports. But it's also there's there's no like legal thing of what workers should get as a percentage of total revenue in any business. So I was thinking like it's like I know the fighters are way underpaid. There's not an argument that, that can be made to me on, that would dispute that way underpaid especially when we compare them to boxers or NHL players or whatever. But legally, you know, like what, you know, is there a legal rule they signed the contract type of thing? As time went on, you know, and, and a lot more came out, it did, uh, you know, the the obviously the thing had way, way, way more teeth because when it was first filed, it was almost like, you know, is this thing even going to go anywhere? And then all of a sudden it was like, you know, I mean, it lasted a long time, which – you know, whatever. And then, it, but it, it looked it like it, it, it felt, especially by, by the judge's rulings that um, it could be, you know, disastrous. And I mean, I guess from a lawyer standpoint, what, why do you think they settled now? Do, do, do you think that they did not feel they had leverage for more? Um, you know, you know what I mean? It's, and, 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 and for this figure, um, I mean, I know like one of the things is like, even if they let's say they got a billion dollar settlement, right? Um, the reality is, is that it would then be appealed and then it would be appealed again, probably. And it would take forever. And this one, at least, um, you know, it's it's over and they're 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 getting a lot of a lot, a lot, a lot of cash in, in, the, in the in the situation. But, but kind of how do you view, view that aspect of it? Yeah. So so there's always two sides to the coin and. The worst case scenario for the UFC was terrifying, right? Because you're right, it could have been one, $1.5 billion tripled plus lawyer fees. Then they've got the Johnson case coming at them, which right. who knows how many hundreds of millions or billions that would be. And then they get injunctive relief as part of the Johnson case. So the court could say, look, you guys ain't doing this moving forward, right? We've We've remedied the past. And moving forward, you guys can't do this kind of stuff. And, and so then their business model was fundamentally at risk. So the UFC's worst case scenario was terrifying. And I always thought the UFC would be insane to run this thing. Like it, it'd just be nuts for them not to try to settle it. Of course. The other side of that coin, um, and, and it was a hell of a strong case. Like you, you probably read the certification decision 
cover to cover. Yeah. What a 70 page judgment. That was a one sided ass kicking. I mean, the absolutely. Yeah. Right. The fighters kicked the UFC's ass and it was damaging. It, it basically read like game over. But but here's here's the one thing I thought of when I read that back in the 80s. You might remember this. The USFL sued the NFL. They basically right. said the NFL is an illegal monopoly. They've got all these deals in place and they're they're keeping competition out. And that went to jury trial and the USFL won. They, they, they kicked the NFL's ass. They won. And then the jury was asked to award damages. And I don't know if you remember what the jury I gave. I remember. Them. Yeah. One dollar. One dollar. <laughs> One dollar. And then they tripled it and they wrote a check for three dollars. And, and I think that was published in Sports Illustrated. Like the NFL basically trolled them. So way to win. Here's your three dollars. And then it, it was trouble for the USFL. That and, was and them so, kicking uh, Donald Trump's butt, by the way. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But but it's an interesting history lesson because you get some strangers off the street in Las Vegas and yep. they sit there and they listen to all this evidence and, and you know, economists are talking about stuff that most folks can't understand. And they're getting into the minutia of um, these numbers and how they're coming up with it. And they're being cross-examined and who knows, like you see this stuff discussed online and half the people's views are just, ah, if you don't like it, don't sign the contract. And, and to, to know that a jury is going to get it right, they might get it right. Or they might, give them a Pyrrhic victory where they say, okay, you win, but we come up with some absurdly low dollar figure. It could have been all over the map. And so there's always, you know, like I would have loved to have been in that room as they're mediating with each other. And I bet you they ran mock trials with mock juries in terms of knowing what evidence the court's going to hear. And I, I would guess they got some scary feedback. I bet you some of the times when they, um, you know, used a mock jury, they didn't like the outcome. And so there's there's reason for both sides to to settle this case. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's actually interesting. I never thought of it in that way. Now, in again, like I guess like the real story is probably coming out 45 to 60 days from now because of what other stipulations may have been involved in this settlement. Um, you know, it, 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 in as, as far as like, um, were they were they basically seeking the idea of obviously um, shorter term contracts, and um, uh, um, as far as also like making the championships or finding a way to make the championships? I mean, I mean, and, and, and you know, like boxing, and, and in a lot of ways, I think that what they were looking for is is more of a boxing model because when we look at what the boxers make um, at the top level. Um, as compared to what the UFC fighters and MMA fighters, but UFC fighters can suit against UFC, where UFC fighters in a business that generates far, far, far more revenue um, make, um, you know, it's it, the difference is, is gigantic. And, you know, it is because boxing, there's a lot more competition with promoters and UFC by creating their own world championships as, as far as having like actual legitimate world championships um it gives them complete control because the championships are pretty much like your you know with the exception of a conor mcgregor fight or something like that or you know somebody gets you know super popular which is you know rare you know generally your championships are are going to be your biggest grossing thing so the control of the championships um is is you know a big way to um control the you know biggest fights so to speak and i mean francis naganu is probably the real example because obviously he was the ufc heavyweight champion and he left and ufc just created another heavyweight champion you know because that's how it's how it's done and would be done with anyone else at this stage of the game yeah no no they own they own the title Fighters don't have property rights over it, and it hurts them financially, right? It's it's a real thing, as opposed to boxers enjoying those property rights in their rank and their title. So now they've got an asset that the open market could bid on. But 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 if if your question was what was the injunctive relief that they wanted, I think what they wanted, and and they would have had to specify it in the Johnson case. It never got that far. But I think what they were seeking were one-year contracts. So to the extent that if the UFC wanted exclusive contracts, that if you sign with us, you can't fight for anybody else during the contract, 
it could only be one year. And it doesn't matter if you're the champion. It doesn't matter if, if you turn down a fight. It doesn't matter anything. After one year, everybody's a free agent. And, and I don't know if that then makes it the boxing model, but what that would do is really increase competition for these fighters. The Bellators, the PFLs, the one championships of the world could now bid on these top stars regularly, and you're going to have movement of talent, and, and the fighters would be able to demand a lot more money. And then if you get these other organizations bringing in some of these top fighters, you're going to have a lot more uh, desire amongst the promoters to co-promote certain bouts as well because you don't have them all under under one roof. But to me, it seems that the UFC's grip on the sport is way stronger now than it was when the lawsuit started. And, and I just really wonder what's going to happen to shake that up because right now, not only are they the behemoth in terms of financial, um, you know, profits, but the, the way they have the feeder system into the sport now, you've got all these organizations with fight pass contracts and their champions get fed into Dana White's contender series. So then the UFC gets options on all of these guys. And so they basically have the whole sport tied up from bottom up from anybody that starts getting any kind of success or star power. They're now really fed into the UFC. And so it's really tough for competing promoters to get access to that good talent. And And I do hope that there's, you know, like like if the antitrust lawsuit was the jab, I hope there's a good right cross coming to follow up just to just to give a little more balance back to the fighters because it is you know it's a tough that's a tough profession to make it in. Like oh, know, yeah. the, the, really so tough. few succeed, and the ones that succeed, it's almost impossible for them to really really capitalize on their star power in those key years just because of how these contracts get structured. So it's it's a ruthless business. Well, I mean, we've seen, you know, now that there's, you know, again, like uh, on, a, on a national basis, you know, we could say UFC would really like turn it around like 2005 with Ultimate Fighter and getting their first major television deal. So we've we had we've had now had almost 19 years of this. And in that period, I mean, what we've seen is is even fighters that got really, really popular over the years that are that are long gone. I mean, for the most part. Very few have come out what I would call, you know, like financially successful to to the point of, you know, like um, being free and clear for life, so to speak. I mean, there are, you know, there's for, for every George St. Pierre, there's, you know, 1500 that, that aren't George St. Pierre, so to speak. Yeah, no, you know, I couldn't agree with you more. And in the soundbite I always use is broken, broken. Like if you're going into this career, chances are, and even if you make it to the UFC, there's a very good chance you retire broken, broken. Like, like you're not right. making life-changing money. The toll on the physical health is very, very serious. I mean, there's no downplaying CTE and chronic post-concussive issues and just the way the joints and everything else gets worn out. And then you don't have the long-term health insurance. You usually don't have any kind of transferable skills once you age out of the sport. And it's really, you know, the back end of the career is really, you know, really ugly. Actually, your your good friend, Carla Duran, a uh, quick shout out to her. I, I sit on a foundation with her called Fighting Foundation, and we help. I, you know, I won't name any names, but we help some retired fighters get into rehab and get uh, other assistance that they need. But, but the picture you see on the back end of the pro fight career in MMA is, is pretty ugly. And, and yeah. yeah, very few enjoy the success that championship boxers uh, enjoy just because they could monetize their, their sports so much better. So, you know, I'm sort of like a broken record, but, but there does need to be some kind of market correction. And this, I, I I'm, I'm actually very eager to see what other terms are there. The other thing I'm eager about Dave is I know the chances of this are very slim, but this settlement isn't over the finish line yet. The court has to approve the settlement. So these, you know, you have 1,200 fighters in Lee and in Johnson. It, it actually has to get certified to then get settled. So Johnson has to get certified to who knows how many hundreds of fighters that's going to apply to. And then all of those fighters get notified about the details of the settlement and they all have a right to object to it. So if anybody thinks it is unfair, they've got the right to talk to the court about that. The Department of Justice gets notified about the settlement, and they've got the right to intervene and to object and to tell the court if they think there's some concerns. And the DOJ has been doing that more 
frequently in recent years in the U.S. So, so occasionally they do speak up and say, look, we've got a problem with the settlement. And again, I'm not, I'm not talking badly about the settlement, but I'm curious to see with that background about whether any fighters object, whether any interveners speak to the court. I'm curious what Judge Bolwer does, given how strong his certification decision was, because that that basically read like a liability finding. That that certification decision was so one-sided. It was basically the court saying, you guys have an illegal monopsony and you're abusing it. So I'm really curious to see what the judge's comments are over the proposed settlement. That's going to be that's going to be the final interesting chapter of all of this. I, I do have a quick question. Uh, and I think most people who don't understand how the UFC and how boxing and even pro wrestling work, their question may simply be, well, why don't they have a union that protects them against a lot of these things? And the, I can in individual sports. It's very difficult to have a right. union, you know, but and go ahead. Go ahead. Here. Well, and that, and that was really my question was like, cause I can think back of, you know, when the fighter kits came out or when, you know, everyone had to wear these under armor shoes, it sounds like, the fighters didn't really have a say one way or another. It was like, this is what you're going to do. We're going to give you this small piece of, uh, you know, of, of our revenue for it. And then so be it. Like, could, I don't, I don't know. Could we ever see a, like, I, we don't even hear about them these days. Like even people trying to, to get those things together. It's just, well, there, there, there've been a few, there've been a few union tries, but they've never gotten anywhere basically. Yeah. Is it just impossible? Do you think? I, I don't know that I don't know that it's impossible, but but yeah, it's very difficult. A, a few years back, Leslie Smith teamed up with a lawyer named Lucas Middlebrook, and, and they right. started something called Project Spearhead, and they were trying to unionize the sport. And she actually did a wonderful job. She made real strides. Uh, she talked about unionization. The UFC cut her before her last fight happened. She claimed that was retaliation against her for her discussing the union. And she might have been right. She might have been uh, right. Yeah. Only the UFC know why they cut her. But she then went to the National Labor Relations Board and said, look, I'm an employee and I got discriminated against. But that died on the vine in the Trump administration. So sure. just for just for political reasons, the NLRB um, probably viewed it differently than they would right now. Um but but the big question comes down to, are they employees or independent contractors? If they're independent contractors, they can't unionize. The contract says they're independent contractors, but there's a very live debate about whether they're mischaracterized. Just because the UFC says you're an independent contractor doesn't mean that you are. And when you look at how much control the UFC exercises over these men and women, there is, you know, there's a good faith argument you could advance that they're actually employees. But to get the numbers together to form a union when you have the talent scattered all over the globe and all sorts of different gyms. It's not like the NHL where you get the 30 guys in the same locker room and they could go out and have dinner afterwards and say, look, we need to unionize. Uh, it, it's just much. And, that, and that wasn't, that wasn't easy either though. If you remember, no, about no. The, the no, ho- no. you know, the hockey stuff, you know, when, when that whole went down. Yeah. Yeah. It takes decades, right? Like, like yeah. none of this stuff, None of this stuff comes easy. It comes with a lot of resistance, with a big fight. That, you know, the UFC know they're going to uh, reduce their profits significantly if it happens. So there's big forces fighting against it. And fighters just as a group, like I'm not trying to say anything disparaging, but but fighters as a group just just seem a bit you know, very individualistic as, as opposed to more, more group thinking, maybe because it's an individual sport as opposed to these, these team sports, but it just seems so much tougher to get fighters on the same page during their career. A lot of them retire and look back hindsight 2020, but when they're, when they're in the midst of their career, it's, it's tough to get people to stand up and put their neck on the line. And, and guys, I'm so sorry. I just got um, a text here. There's, there's something I have to run off to and, and deal okay. on an emergency basis. I apologize for, cutting this short, but if there's another final question, I'm happy to tackle that before I leave. Make okay. sure you talk about the thing that you wanted to talk about before we go to the, the GoFundMe that you were mentioning. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. Let me let me just pull it up here very quickly. So this is a really tragic thing that happened in British Columbia. There was, a, I call it an amateur hobbyist level kickboxing event, and a young man, PhD student, signed up. Uh, he received 
it was advertised as a light contact and controlled contact tournament. He received shots that were not light or controlled, ended up suffering a subdural hematoma. Uh, he's likely in a permanent vegetative state. His family's uh, had tens of thousands of dollars of medical expenses already. And what they're, you know, what they're looking at is a lifetime of care for this young man. So his name is Lee, L-E-I, Zhen Wan, Z-H-E-N-H-U-A-N. And if you just Google that name and go fund me, um, if, if you could just spread the word, if you could donate, I appreciate it. If you could just retweet it for one second, just to help spread the word. A lot of great people have donated over $30,000 already. That's It's tremendous. And a lot more needs to be done for this family. So I appreciate you letting me um, just, just give a quick shout out to that fundraiser. And guys, thank you for having me on. I do apologize. I just got an urgent matter I uh, wasn't expecting. I, I've got to run prematurely. I'm sorry. Okay. Thanks, we'll Eric. Talk, we will talk very soon. Thanks, Eric. Thanks so much. Cheers. All right. Okay. Um, that that was very informative uh, for, for me because I was reading your piece, obviously, today, uh, which was really good. And uh, I came to the same conclusion immediately when I saw that number the other day. I was like, wow, that's it. And and it's uh, funny. It's funny because it, it's so much money. But, you know, like when I saw when, when I got the thing um, the other morning. And I saw, you know, it was basically the T- TKO, um, you know, all the TKO um, stock stuff. I mean, I get in my email, you know, immediately. And I looked at that and it's like, because I knew, you know, I, I, I think we'd, we had talked, but I had written, you know, that, the, that they were probably, they were in the, they were in settlement talks. I expected a settlement. I, I but I, and, it, and it's funny because it was, it was a ton of money, but because of how much money was theoretically at stake, you know, I was, I did expect a larger number from the settlement. And it was interesting what Eric said was, you know, like, yeah, we can look at it from, from our eyes and look at it this way. But if you bring in jury people, you know, off the street that don't know UFC and don't know any of this, you know, there's no guarantee that you, that you're, you're going to win. Even if the judge himself obviously was very much a proponent, you know, there's no guarantee that a jury will. So you've got, you know, you've got that going for you, but, um, I think that probably the best thing when it comes to this subject is, you know, when this um, when the full all of the stuff comes out, 45 to 60 days, we probably will have a more, um, you know, a lot more that we can talk about knowing a lot more um, on the subject to see what else was done. Um, and then I know and I'm going to actually talk to Eric about a few things afterwards about this, too. Maybe, so. maybe we can even bring him back when that I, I think that that out. point to bring him back would be good. And also. You know, the other part is is to look at from from a TKO standpoint um, and, and a lawsuit standpoint this is a thing that I from almost like the early part of this trial is just like if this is successful and and at three hundred thirty five million, it is successful. OK, maybe, you know, it, it, it didn't hurt the stock of the company because of the scaredness of it and everything like that. But what uh, most of the stuff that, that UFC is accused of. Um, you could certainly argue um, as far as the, you know, uh, dominant domination of the uh, marketplace and everything like that. Um, WWE would be very similar. The funny part is, is that the one thing that WWE has going for it, and it actually pointed this out in the, in the MLW suit that, you know, you, that UFC really doesn't and, and hasn't in a while since there's no, since pride went because Bellator never got, Bellator had a point where it got kind of, kind of strong, but never that strong. Mm-hmm. But WWE does have AEW, you know, which is not that it's like super duper strong, but it's it's as a secondary group, it's pretty damn strong. And so they could go and argue that like, hey, you know, like before, you know, it's like ninety percent plus market share. Well, WWE was was well over ninety percent you know, probably 95% or more. And then AEW comes along and now it's, you know, probably, you know, I haven't done the numbers lately, but it's about 86% the last time I checked. And, 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 you know, the under 90 does help them in that situation. But if you're suing over those years before, you know, like before 2019, everything's the same and more. And, and WWE wrestlers um, do not get the same percentage of revenue that UFC fighters get. But they're also happier, um, partially because there's 
hundreds and hundreds of UFC fighters to split their 17%. And let's say WWE is 10%. There's um, a lot less wrestlers. So they are making per person a lot more, um, but they are still getting a lower percentage of the overall pie than, than the, um, you know, athletes in most sports and boxers or, or tennis players or, or, you know, any, you know, hockey players or football players, obviously. And this goes back to things that I've always read. You mentioned about why WWE wrestlers don't have a union. And it's because the, the top, 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 they're generally happy. And yeah. thus you could never get those guys to agree because why would we change anything that, that they're happy with? And on the UFC side, it does seem a little bit more. Uh, m- maybe I would I would expect it to be a little easier just because the upper card seems to change so quickly these days with the turnaround. You don't see someone like I don't know who's yeah, we don't have we don't, to we, Randy Orton, right? Like who's who's going to be Randy Orton in the UFC? Yeah, yeah, we don't have we don't well we don't even have Anderson Silva's and George St. Pierre's anymore that have these giant long championship reigns because um. You know, people come along pretty quick now. Take you know, John Jones and Conor McGregor out of that situation, and there's no, there's no. There, take those two out, and there, and and maybe out of Sonya, who's who's no longer champion anymore, um, and and Conor isn't either for that matter. But um, you know, there's not, um, you know, there's not any giant drawing cards like there were, and giant drawing cards are not nearly as important as they were because of the nature of how, you know the revenue has changed, you know, because with, with all the money guaranteed and it's the same with WWE, it's like UFC, you know, before UFC and, and WWE at certain points, you know, with, you know, when certain people were, you know, Hulk Hogan being the obvious example, were, were so instrumental in the company. Um, you know, there was a lot more, you know, a, a lot more leverage. Whereas now, I mean, I don't care if it's John Cena or Roman Reigns or Dwayne or anybody, I mean, they can go tomorrow and the company's not going to miss a beat. Um, and UFC is the same thing. I mean, it, it would have hurt, you know, years and years ago if, if Conor McGregor had left. It would have hurt a lot. But now it's like, you know, it's it's they're they're not even rushing to book a guy. You know what I mean? It's like, well, we'll book you when we want to book you, you know, which I guess is going to be the summer. But still, yeah. it's not like um, they're not beholden to him. His leverage his leverage is nothing like it was, you know, seven years ago. Put it that way. I guess we should start with this Jack Perry story because you mm-hmm. wrote in the Observer about the communication between him and Tony Khan, and then I think Brian wrote a story on the website today where Jack disagreed with some of what you wrote. Yeah, he says he did not apologize, but he did have the timeline, you know, like where you know he he had gone through. Uh, for a while, they didn't talk. Then I guess he had November, a couple months later, when they did talk, and then they were going to bring him back. And then he thought that um, when Punk came back, that all of a sudden the talk of bringing him back cooled off. And he said he even asked for his release. And, um, you know, now he's in New Japan. You mean he's, when Punk went to WWE? When Punk started, yeah, at Survivor Series. He said that, that, that uh, like, the talk of bringing him back kind of cooled off. But he said he never apologized. I had heard that he had you know, apologized and wanted to, you know, wanted to come. Obviously he wanted to come back. And when he wasn't being brought back, um, I guess he asked for his release and was turned down. And now he's in New Japan doing his gimmick. And um, we'll see what happens. Do you know what he has left on his contract? No, I don't know the time frame left on his contract. But like I said before, it's like I could understand the suspension of him when it was made at the time, you know, in August. Um, I didn't disagree with it or anything like that, but after about two months, it was kind of like, okay, you know, it's, it's time to bring him back. You know what I mean? It's like, um, because what he said, you know, if it wasn't for punk, you know, react punk's reaction to what he said, he wouldn't, you know, I mean, what he said would not have even been an issue to anyone, you know? Um, and because of what happened, it became an issue and you know and all that but it's like to me it's like it's it's time to bring the guy back um but you know we'll have to wait and see how this all all plays out you know i mean it's um i just you know again like it's it's seven months you know it's like for that you know it's like no i mean like 
you know, if, if <laughs> we've had guys get into backstage real fights without suspensions for seven months, yeah. um, let alone a line that, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure everyone wishes that he never said it was, it was not, you know, it was just, wouldn't, you know, I, I understand why he said it. I mean, I totally understand why he did it, but it's probably would have been better not to. And if it was with yep. somebody else, it still would have caused a confrontation, but they probably would have, you know, with anyone else, they'd have gone, why'd you say it? Blah, blah, blah. They might even dislike each other, but it would, you know, it would have been gone the next day. You know what I mean? There might be like a little grudge going further, but nobody would talk about it and nobody would care. And there certainly be no suspensions or anything coming off of it. So, um, yeah, that's the deal. Okay. Here's the other thing in reading your story that I, kind of didn't understand which is the dis- the communication between the two of them was through AEW's lawyers at first and then he and Tony um did talk um sometime later you know i think is it because of the suspension that he had to communicate through the lawyers um because there was all- no legal thing I don't know of the the deep. I, I think it was maybe that Tony just didn't talk to him until Tony finally talked to him. Huh. It it sounds like uh, at least it, it sounds like from my perspective, from the outside looking in, Tony blames Jack for having for for having to suspend Punk. And then when having Punk fire, show, having to fire, yeah, Punk. sorry, having to fire Punk. And then when Punk shows up in WWE. It's just worse, and it's just like, well, you know that that see see what happened. You made it worse, and now he's on the opposition. It seems like that is what Perry is actually being blamed for. I can't say that, but I can't disagree with that um, either. You know, I mean, it 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 has always felt to me really weird when he was gone for you know past that whatever it was. You know, the first month. You know, I figured, yeah, he'll be suspended for a month, six weeks. You know, even two months. Once that period ended, and then it was kind of like, and, and again, you know, people have asked Tony about Jack, including me, and it's always a non, it was always a non-answer. You know what I mean? It was always like, it, it, I can't talk about it, or I won't talk about it, or or just not, or just not an answer. And mm-hmm. I just thought, like, after again, after like two months were up, I just thought that's that's weird because it wasn't, you know, as far as like a a, a thing, I didn't feel it was like, you know. Uh, that bad compared to so many other things that happen in wrestling on a daily basis. And, and, um, you know, I mean, we'll just have to watch the whole thing play out, but, but yeah, like I was told that he did apologize. He claims he never apologized for it at all. And so that's, that is the basic disagreement of what I was told and what he said, everything else is pretty much, you know, okay. You know, I mean, I guess, I guess he's says he has no date to return and I don't know that he has a date to return, but, I sure hope he returns because yeah. that would be really ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and again, and if he's never going to return, then look if you if you don't want to book him for whatever reason, then then re- yeah, release him, let him work for New Japan full time. So, or 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 WWE for that matter, which right. would probably who would probably I'm sh- <laughs> that would be interesting because WWE for sure would want to take him, but. Punk would probably blow a gasket if they did. Um, But I don't think that Punk has anywhere near the influence on Levesque and these guys that he had on Tony Khan. So it becomes a really weird issue. And again, WWE doesn't need anyone and doesn't need any trouble. And they may just go, hey, you know, we don't need the trouble. But, I, you know, Jack's a good wrestler. Also, you know, in WWE, obviously, size, you know, but it's not as it's not as big a deal. And um you know, the whole thing of, um, you know, the the Luke Perry son and everything like that. I mean, WWE is going to like that, too. You know, they like that that clinging into a mainstream thing. Um, so, bah, you know, I guess we just have to wait to see how it all plays out. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be a nice uh, experiment to see if Punk does have that kind of uh, ability to to say no on stuff or to create some sort of you know, hey, I don't, I don't know if this is safe for us to work together. But uh, on the other end, it would be good for WWE to say, nope, like we can handle this scenario. Like we, you know, w- we understand how to deal with these types of things. You both can be working for the same company. And, right. not have to- you know, I mean, AEW should be the same way. 
Yes. Should've. I mean, I mean, should've. I mean, it, 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 it should have from from day one. I mean, it, it always should have, you know, but whatever. Can we look at some uh, WrestleMania big picture stuff here? Sure. Now you, you, you had all the matches that are currently uh, currently signed for the show. Uh, there are still going to be some that are going to be added. And I was mostly looking at the big picture of, you know, when you go back through the history of the show, you know, the mainstream uh, knowledge of, of what's going on here. Uh, and you, we can even go back, what, it's uh, WrestleMania 28 and, and 29 when The Rock comes back against John Cena. Because of just, I guess, the different media and how Peacock instead of pay-per-view, it feels like this is bigger and more mainstream than that time was. And I think The Rock is also a bigger star. Rock but- was a really big star then, too, though. Yeah, he was. I, I, he you was. know, you know, I mean, Rock and Cena was a, a both of them, especially the first one, was a giant match. Also, because of you know the um, it had its built-in storyline because Vince manipulated Cena into ripping Rock, <laughs> you know, because Vince was mad that Rock wasn't at the time coming back, and then Rock used it, you know, to um, and and the irony of that, obviously, you know, Cena's apologized for that many times anyway. So, you know, because now he's in the same shoes. But the, um, but the, you know, the Rock used that to make it real, which was, yeah. you know, a big thing. And and you know, again, here in this one, he's tried to do the same thing with with Cody and everything like that. You know, and it was w- would have been the same way with Roman is is to make it real because that's, you know, um, that's his. Um, I guess, you know, again, coming from um, the old school of wrestling, you know, being, fo- you know, the guy has followed wrestling. Dwayne was born in 72. So I would say he was following wrestling in its in his own weird way by probably 78, 79. And he was probably in his own way intelligently following it because of the grandmother's promoter and everything like that from the early eighties, long before he ever got into the business. And then he was a student of the business when he was in the business. Um, You know, he's going to go and think of things in that way to, to try to make it more real than, than, um, you know, um, maybe, I mean, he also has a lot more latitude on what he can say than other people would have. Obviously that's, that's been pretty clear. Just as, as an aside, how many people do you think, percentage wise, think that Rock's mom is actually being inducted into the WWE Hall of Fame? It feels like everybody. Oh, <laughs> really? I suppose his grandmother. Yeah, I think people keep screwing that one up. Oh, yeah. They think it's his mom. Um, I, I just, I'm like, I'm trying to go back and, you know, I'm reading the 89 Observer. So, you know, I'm reading Hogan and Savage and how big that is to a national audience. And the pay-per-view audience was, was so much smaller back then, obviously. But uh, and, and then uh, Hogan, you know, Hogan and Savage did giant pay-per-view numbers. Yeah, it was their biggest one for the longest time, right? Right. Yeah, they were um, with, with a lot less homes having pay-per-view. They were um, like seven hundred sixty-seven thousand, I think, and in that range was the number of the um, the one WrestleMania that they headlined. And yeah, that would have been the biggest until. Um, Oh my God! Probably fourteen, fourteen, fifteen. Um, you know the the um, the Tyson one was a little bit below, so it'd been right after the Tyson one, probably the year or two after that. So fifteen, you know. sixteen. Yeah, and then since the, since then, you know, it was you know until it, they went off, then they beat that number um, most years, you know, because um, they were over, they were hovering around the million mark, and 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 Dwayne and um, and Cena was uh, I think one million. Um, I think it was 1,217,000 was the final number, um, which was the second biggest. The Trump number was the biggest. Um, although a lot of places had that wrong because of the originally reported number of the rock uh, seen the number was the highest because if you like, if you follow, you know, my coverage of the pay-per-views um, now, because we're getting like, you know, the numbers to the numbers, it's like, you know, the week one numbers often don't tell the story. And then, you know, you are, you know, like, when I'm, you know, when I'm going through this, it's like, um, and it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. That's like, like first week, um, then second week, then third week. And you get like slightly different, you know, um, things because of how numbers are reported and how mm-hmm. people buy late and everything like that. It's, um, you know, you really don't know until, um, you know, I, I, at a month, at a month out, you pretty much know. 
And I mean, the final t- uh, tallies aren't in until three months out, but a month out, you have a pretty good idea. And then, you know, the first week, second week, they're, they're good estimates, but they're, they're not perfect. And, um, you know, so, so anyway, like with the, the Trump one, the final number was much higher. And with the, with the Dwayne and Cena one, the final number was a little bit lower than the original number that was announced, but the, they're the two biggest. And then the um, Cena and uh, rock number two was the third biggest. Bobby Lashley should, if he, if he, if he turns heel again, he should use that as a part of his gimmick. The, the, I was the biggest selling draw in WrestleMania history. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you, I don't know if you could even do this, but WrestleMania, the original one, 40 years ago, WrestleMania 3, WrestleMania 5, uh, 14 with Tyson, and then we get to, to the Rock ones. You know, obviously that Attitude Era is big, but like from a pop culture perspective or from a public audience kind of perspective, where would you rate what we're going through now compared to some of the bigger ones of yesteryear? So more people will watch this one because it's on Peacock and it's available uh, easier and cheaper, you know, because there will probably be, you know, three million, you know, but that's that's three million. Um, but the thing with that is that's people who tune in, you know, like they could tune in for five minutes or whatever. It's not like when you were buying a pay-per-view, you were watching the whole thing from start to finish. When you're going to a closed circuit, you're watching the whole thing. When you're, you know, going on Peacock, you may, you know, tune in for one match and yeah. that's it. You know, it's 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 a completely different dynamic, but more people will watch this, these two than ever before. But as far as like culturally, I do not think that this is is close to number one. Um, I mean, we'll know the week of, but um, hey, there's I don't think there's any way. WrestleMania one, the day of that day of that show. I mean, that was just gigantic culturally at a level that that none of the other ones were. I mean, even even the Rock and Cena, and even with Trump. Um, those were very big, you know, um, the Mayweather one got a lot of publicity, you know, with Ric Flair's retirement, um, but didn't do the the numbers um, that the ones I mentioned did. Um, the the um, WrestleMania three was was very, very big, but but mainstream wise, number one was the biggest. The, um, the it's, it's funny because like the idea of. Hogan and Mr. T being on Saturday Night Live is still kind of wacky to me because uh, they were a, like a fill in, right? Like someone canceled and and so they were brought in. Yeah, I remember the, the background of everything, but it was a it was a lot of for, fortunate things happened the week of the show. I do remember that, like because WrestleMania won a week out. I mean, it was not looking like it would be a success. I mean, everyone was scared, and then the last week it got so much publicity, and then it was a big success. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I was thinking about here is I was a little worried when The Rock came in that Cody Rhodes would be a little overshadowed. And I think he has to, to some extent. How can you not be? Every, everyone's overshadowed by Dwayne, but I think Cody Rhodes has done great. And, and that was going to be my question, because if you look at the Raw ratings, his segments – are up clearly crazy. the highest thing on the show, even beating the lead in, even be, be, beating the beginning of the show. And so, well, well the nine o'clock is going to always be the highest now because of um, just there's a lot of reasons for it, but the, it, it it just is um, well, because a lot of people tune in late now, you know, because the the idea that uh, the first hour is a throwaway, um, and you maybe only want to watch two hours of the show. Um, that's one of the reasons why hour three is is not dropping like it used to as well Mm -hmm. um you know so so um nine o'clock is the prime spot but still like this week's jump if you look at it 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 was it was more than just okay that's the thing you know um and cody's segments have done great yes um but um yeah i think um i mean it's funny because i think roman's the one who was the one who ended up who who was felt such like such a giant star I think that he's the one who really feels the most overshadowed by by Dwayne, not Cody. Cody, I think, has really risen to the occasion in a big, big way. And it's funny because, like, you know, watching everything, to me, like the dream match, the big match would be Rock and Cody, not not um, not Roman Reigns and Cody. Roman Reigns and Cody's big because of the championship and the story of the chase. But as far as the individual grudge and all that, I think that Rock and Cody's actually the, you know, Easily would be the bigger match of the two. 
Well, and you get you get you somewhat get it on night one. I don't know how much they're going to touch, but they're they'll, well, they'll do something. They're, they're going to have to do a lot because that's what everyone's watching it for. I mean, they may they may keep them apart early, which means Roman's going to have to work a lot, right? Um, but um, Cody's mom's going to have to be ringside as well, by the way. And Dwayne's mom, but well, we know Dwayne's mom will be ringside. Yeah, she's a, she's a, she's she's a, she's a ringside at Mania most of the time anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we, even even if it's not for him, you know, with the Usos and Roman and Nia Jax and everyone, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you also wrote in the Observer that you believe Austin Taker and Cena will be involved in some way at WrestleMania. They've been there's talk with all of them, and I mean, as far as what, um, don't know, but yeah, I mean, Cena Cena's probably going to be in. And then I asked about Austin, and it's like, yeah, there's definitely talk with him, and 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 I didn't even ask about Taker. It was kind of when I asked about Austin, I go, yeah, you know, all three are in the discussion phase and, you know, what it's going to be is not like, it's not like before where we knew six weeks out, we don't know, but there'll probably be a spot for them in some form. I mean, Cena's pretty much said I'm free that day. And I mean, as far as what he can do and, you know, all of them are going to do whatever they want to do in the sense of, you know, however physically they want, you know, much they want to do, that's what they'll do. And, and with Cena, it's you know Cena's it's, it's a little trickier because it depends on what he's got scheduled. Because if he's got something you know scheduled, he can't risk an injury. And so um, you know you you you, know, you got to do what you can do without risking an injury. Because what happened with Dwayne, you know, with Hercules, pretty much all of Hollywood kind of knows that story. And yeah, him move it back a month and everything. So like Dwayne can't do any movies because he's doing this match for a while, May first actually. Um, is so it's 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 three three four weeks is is what he's been given before he's starting his movie. But it's his own. It's also his own movie company. He's only going to have a month of uh, MMA training there. He might be doing other stuff too. I mean, he might have been doing that for for a long time. I don't know. Like he it's... can you imagine being as big as he is at his age, going through like MMA boot camp? I know, I know. Well, just the age part of it. Um, I mean, it's weird because it's like, you know, by this, um, Dwayne's going to be, you know, I think 50, 52, he's almost 52 and he's going to be playing, you know, a 25 year old guy, right? 28 year old guy, whatever Mark Kerr was in his heyday and then older. And it's, um, I mean, Mark Kerr certainly had the, the body, um, but, um, yeah, and I, people have already brought that up when he first said he was going to play Mark Kerr. You know, like, he's, you're 47 years old, and that was, you know, <laughs> years ago. 47 maybe, years old trying to play an active MMA M- MMA superstar. Maybe they have, they do it in which he plays the old version of Mark Kerr, remembering, and then they have the kid who was on Young Rock who was playing, because uh, <laughs> he, lo- he looks like him. Yeah, yeah, you get a young, a young Mark, get, get a young bodybuilder to play Mark Kerr who's... <laughs> There's, there's, you know, yeah, whatever, yeah. Uh, the Ronda Rousey book excerpt or conversation that that came out. Uh, I I do like it, it's interesting because I think what she's saying is, is is very powerful, but a lot of the people that I find in the fandom who may sort of agree with or. Uh, you know, be, be the type of people who would want that message out there. They don't like Rhonda for one reason or another uh, because of, I don't, some, you know, goofy things she said in the past or, you know, just how uh, much of an she, alpha, alpha, alpha dog that she is. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot that you could say about Rhonda. I mean, it's like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly understand because, um, She's not always endearing by any means. And I think that it's funny, the first run that she had, I think people, um, you know, she did really, really well in her first run, considering how little experience and training she had. The second one, it was like her star power had dropped and she wasn't as over as she was the first time, but she was still and 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 really wasn't as good. It didn't seem like I mean, her matches didn't seem as good. And um so there was that kind of that resentment, like the first time she was in, whether you liked her or disliked her, she was a giant, giant star. It kind of and, modeled her UFC career in a weird way. She was yeah. a dandy. Everybody loved her. Then she had some turbulence. She herself maybe didn't react to it uh, very well. 
Yeah, and that it, caused think, their popularity to go down in both cases. I think so. I think that you're right. Um, and um, I mean, her MMA career, I mean, the, the, the psychology of Ronda Rousey's MMA career is absolutely fascinating. I mean, um, just, you know, I, 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 I don't think that people kind of like, I, I, I don't know how, how many athletes could, could even understand like you're, you're doing so well. And so many, I, I never saw someone, um, I'm sure there are in, in, in football and other sports, but I never saw someone that so many people wanted to see fail. And, you know, like her whole thing was for that all that time, all you people want to see me fail. And then she does a fight and wins in 30 seconds. And it's kind of like, fuck you. Right. Mm -hmm. But then she lost. And then like all those people were just like, see, see. And it was like, and then, you know, she never recovered from it um, at all. You know, I mean, she was never the same in after, after the Holly Holm fight. Yeah. I, you know, I still feel like the credit, Becky Lynch receives and and she deserves some of it is really like Rhonda's credit when it comes to there's, there's both there's both because because Becky did get over on her own I mean it was you know the luck of Nia punching her in the face and Becky being able to do a good promo and a lot of different things right place right time they wanted to turn her heel the people didn't want her to turn heel so they fought it and I mean there were a lot of circumstances that helped Becky however you know become at one point, the biggest star in the company, even if it was short lived, but but she really wasn't. She's the only woman. I mean, we were kind of look back historically. Becky Lynch is still the only woman wrestler um, in the history, whether it's U.S., Mexico, Japan, Europe, anywhere, who was the number one wrestler as far as popularity in the world, even if it was for a brief period of time. However, if it was not for Ronda, the promotion and plight of the women um, might it would not have been as quick. It yeah. would not have been. There's no way. There's no way because because they were they were being dragged kicking and screaming even with Ronda's success in UFC. And it was Ronda's success in UFC where it just kind of blew the whole idea of, you know, they're they're good to have on a card, but they'll never draw on top. And and it was kind of like, you know, and that was the same thing that they said in in boxing and the same thing that they said in in MMA. Everyone said all they all said the same thing. You can never draw on top. You know, you can never be a main eventer. No one's ever going to pay to see women fight on top. And Ronda blew that one away. And so the excuse of holding the women back in WWE, it's like if you're following, um, you know, Ronda Rousey, it's kind of like, hey, you know, we're missing something because we can create a situation and it's and there's a fan base for it. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, I don't think Ronda does get her credit because um, she sped up what what would have taken a lot slower to happen. Um, so, yeah. Um, but, but Becky was not just a product of Rhonda. Becky was Becky. I, it's just one of those things where I feel that in order for Becky to happen, Rhonda had to happen first. And I'm, I, sure, I, I'm not I, sure it would have been the other way around. I completely agree. Completely. With, without that, the, they would not have had to focus on the women even close to what they had. They would not have, uh, pushed in they would not have given them the tv time because all of that stuff was because you know it's like hey you know look at ufc you know what i mean it's like their biggest star second biggest star depending on the year is a woman and she is drawing so you can't say they can't draw um yeah. and so yes no no the spotlight would not have been, if there was not if there was not a ronda rousey becky lynch still would have been a star woman wrestler um but she would not have had the opportunities that she was given no way yeah, and I, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm not giving Becky credit. I think Becky's great. Um, okay, so uh, I guess the book in and of itself, pretty good timing, though based on what she said, I, I kind of wonder how much anti-Vince and anti-WWE stuff is actually in it. It's she, she I don't think I don't think I don't, I don't I don't think there's a lot of anti-Vince stuff. Okay. Um I mean it's I think that what you got is probably the um, what's what, what's come out is probably the strongest stuff. I'm going to guess. Um, I mean, I'm sure that there's stuff about whatever, you know, I mean, we'll have to read it and, 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 and all that, but I don't think it's like going to be like, I think that the stuff on Vince, because I heard you didn't bury Vince that, that much other than what, you know, you saw like, you know, bearing certain aspects of the company and its history and, and Vince's involvement in history. And, you know, again, you know, reading all that when I'm reading it, it's kind of like, well, 
it's hard to argue what she's saying, right? You know, I mean, it's like, that is what it was. Mm -hmm. That is what the executives were. You know, I mean, it's like, that's, 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 a, that, you know, it's fair. Whether you like Rhonda or you don't like Rhonda, you know, I was reading that and going like, can't argue with that. And then as far as like her, I know she wanted to go, she said she wanted to go harder on Lauren Itis and Bruce Pritchard. Those were the two she really wanted. And I don't know the specifics of, of why with either of them. And per, I hope, hopefully in the book, she at least explains that, you know, like what it is, um, you know, it's probably something that they said, you know, um, and uh, or maybe, you know, maybe how they treated her. You know, you got to remember that, um, you know, when when on the first run, everybody treated her one way and then the second run when she's not as big a star, um, you know, her, her, her UFC super superstardom is gone, even though she's still like a name, but not as big a name as she was. She is she is going to be treated different by management the second time, and and those were key people in management. Um, so they may have said something or viewed something, or I know that there were ideas that she had that got shot down, and um, you know wasn't happy with that, obviously. Yeah. Um. Let's see what else do I? Oh, the Vince doc. You had a note about it's not they had to maybe change direction a little bit and it's probably still coming out at least maybe hopeful uh, in 2024, but it has been pushed. I, my impression is it's going to be 2024. They wanted it out around now, mm -hmm. you know, and that's why I kind of asked is like, cause it didn't feel like it was coming out now. Cause I think I would have heard. And it's just like, you know, I mean that lawsuit, if it wasn't for the law. If it wasn't for the lawsuit, I think it would have been a good chance. It would have been out like in the next couple of weeks. Um, if not a, shortly thereafter, the lawsuit, you know, um, you have to change certain frameworks, but the lawsuit, the lawsuit ends up being, you know, the, no matter what anyone says, I think the lawsuit ends up being the, the biggest part of his legacy. Cause it's the difference between before the lawsuit. Um, it's like, you can kind of do this documentary and it's like, okay, we do have the good stuff and we do have the bad stuff. And it's all kind of there. And in the end, you kind of, okay, he's a complex individual. There's good and there's bad. After the lawsuit, it's kind of like, okay, there is there is the fact that he was the greatest wrestling promoter of all time. But it's 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 kind of like that becomes pale in comparison with what you read in the lawsuit. And that's, all, you know, even though I'm going to guess that um, almost everyone that they interviewed, almost everyone with with, I'm guessing very few exceptions, did nothing but praise him, I'm going to guess. <laughs> um and and that, that's going to be a weird thing watching that thing with this guy, and you have all these guys. Like I, I'll tell you what, you know how people get mad when they when when you um when you praise Vince, you know, like like uh, even like when what, what John Cena said or mm -hmm. um, or uh, Mick Foley or whatever, and people are getting, how can you say that about this guy? Look at what he did, and and I and I sympathize with people who say that too. Um, the fact is is that everyone who gets interviewed in that documentary including me, um, because, I mean, when I did the interviews that I did, um, and certainly the first one, when none of this was out, it's like, yes, did I say negative stuff about Vince in the thing? Absolutely. Did I say positive? Yes. And, um, you know, people will go like, oh, my God, how can you say this about this horrible person who, you know, defecated on this woman and everything? Mm -hmm. And it's like, and maybe, you know, but the point is, is that I was probably as middle of the road, if not negative, um, depending on the question, because it's, you know, I answered questions. You know, if it's a question that was, that got, a, that should get a positive response, I gave one, should get a negative, I gave one. Um, and, you know, but, but most of those people, even when they were asked questions that probably should have been negative responses, I'm going to guess they still try to get positive responses because, you know, that's kind of the nature of people who worked in WWE. How many people like, like with this whole stuff, all the stuff that's out with Vince. Okay. I mean, it's, it's not like, um, yes, yes, yes. This, um, documentary or the, the, the lawsuit, I should say the documentary, um, when, when you're, when you're talking about him, um, there's stuff that goes back his, his negativity stuff, negative stuff goes back to, you know, Jimmy Snuka and before. Mm -hmm. And, the fact is, is that all those interviews that are done decades later, people know all this and still we're going to sugarcoat. I'm sure most of them sugarcoated him. Um, I don't know. I didn't see, you know, the interviews, but I would just assume just from the nature of what people say about Vince. So, um, 
I can just imagine like this this multi part documentary on Vince where you've got all of these ex wrestlers just and business people. What a genius! What a this! What a that! People are gonna like if the documentary isn't done in the right way. You know, people are gonna get really mad at the documentary, um, and you know we'll see. Um, but you know, it's like it's like right now saying a whole bunch of great stuff about Vince is is not gonna make people look uh, great when that thing comes out. I, I think. Mm -hmm. Now, here's an interesting thing in that the Netflix deal that they have for Raw, which starts next year, the fact that they're going to do a documentary on the guy who, you know, could have possibly caused some, you know, some. He could have killed that deal almost. Yeah. But so I, I, are they going to put a documentary out on Netflix as they're promoting this like non Vince McMahon version of WWE? And then they're going to highlight this guy right before Raw comes onto their programming. Isn't that the weirdest thing? Because, you know, when this documentary was done, there was no conversations at all of Netflix getting wrestling. Um, it was just something that, um, you know, that they, they commissioned a big money documentary because of that Vince was fascinating. And certainly, if they knew then what we know now, that documentary doesn't exist in the first place. There's I no feel, way. I feel like it's going to have to lean a little bit more negatively. Like I feel well, like it has to. It has to. It can't. It can't not. Which is puts a lot of pressure on the people who do the final editing. Yeah. But it, it, it. It. If it doesn't. If it doesn't. Um. I just think that people will just really um crap on it like nobody's business. It's got to be. It's got to be very very. I mean. I mean. There's. There's positives in the Vince McMahon story and you, you can't ignore them, but the overall leaning of the documentary at the end, if it's anything but negative, And if this lawsuit isn't covered as this, like, as like the, 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 the key thing. And like the, it's kind of like, yeah, we got this and now we got this and then we got this and this. And then at the end, it's like, boom, the bombshell. This is Vince McMahon. If it's not that um, it's, it's um, um, I, I, I think that it, it deservedly, um, should be heavily criticized because yes, if we're doing the legacy of Vince McMahon, then most, the biggest thing, no matter what anyone says is the, when it comes to Vince McMahon now and how he should be viewed, the lawsuit should be the biggest part because that is a part of Vince McMahon that, uh, I mean, even though, yes, the other stuff is, you know, the creation of all that is good, but it's like, it's like, this is a Weinstein story. It is, it's, it's that. And, and like a documentary on Weinstein, it's like, yes, you can talk about him building these companies and blah, 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 blah. But the end, in the end, you know what I mean? Or like the Cosby thing that you saw, right? Mm -hmm. You can talk about great comedian, America's father, blah, 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 and all, all parts of his life. But in the end, in the end, in that documentary, it's got to be smashing with a hammer. There's no way. There's no, there's no, is there any way around it? No, I don't think so. And what it what it probably means is that more of what you said is probably going to be on the thing. I would imagine, maybe less less talking head stuff. I don't know if like I don't Peter know. Rosenberg and and those guys are going to be on it, but I imagine there's going to be less of that you know sort of kiss butt stuff that that we see in this. Um, so well, it'll well, probably make the thing better. I would okay I would okay. Imagine. Well, it's a multi part series. This is what I know. It's a multi part series, and. Most of it, um, I would say 70 to 80 percent of it was done, if not 90 percent, before the lawsuit was filed and done, as I mean, like these episodes were done. So unless they go back and redo them, the first, let's say, five of the episodes, OK, were, were or four were, were already done. So unless, like I said, they redo them, it's 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 going to lean in a different way than it probably should lean today. That's what, mm -hmm. what I would say. So mm -hmm. it's going to be, it will be very fascinating. And then the, the, the other thing is, is like, it's still like Netflix is pretty much going to be like the, the home of wrestling world on a worldwide basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is the thing. And now we're doing a thing on the background of this company that we're with the guy who created this company. It's like, like I, you know, what are you going to say? Are you really going to, bury him as much as he deserves to be buried when when you've got a five billion dollar deal with the company that even though it was not a deal with him personally it's the company that he created and when you made the deal he was the chairman of that company you know what i mean it's like yes 
they all washed their hands of him because, you know, of that lawsuit. But the fact is, is that this this deal was made before the lawsuit came out. And um, yeah, it's a, you know, and Netflix is a giant company, but they're allocating a lot of resources. Five billion dollars is a lot of money. And and it could be more. And again, it's like they're not even doing like everybody else. Everybody else is doing United States rights, United States rights. This is world rights. Mm-hmm. You know, every 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 country but the United States, um, the whole package, NXT, Raw, SmackDown, pay-per-views, archives, it's all on Netflix. The United States is going to be the only country that has the separate deal for NXT and has the separate deal for SmackDown and for a little while has a separate deal for Peacock and 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 you know. Every in, in from a worldwide basis, I mean, they are in bed with WWE, an incredible amount, and doing this documentary on WWE. I mean, it's the documentary from a political standpoint is going to be very fascinating. And I do, I, I mean, I don't want to judge it until it happens, but mm-hmm. I could easily see it being something that um, that that people now looking at it in, in you know with today's eyes, um, the 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 people behind it have a lot of pressure on them in 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 every in many many different directions because um it's never going to be as negative as as a lot of people will want it to be um and it probably won't be as positive as a lot of people will want it to be too AEW Dynamite and Rampage aired in a 3 hour block on Wednesday because of the NCAA men's basketball tournament uh what did you think of the ratings of both of those shows I mean, the drop in hour, in hour three was was really significant, um, but it still did you know a lot better than Rampage would no, normally do. Um, and it, and again, you know, if you look at it, I mean, it was the number one and number two entertainment show, um, or non. Um, I mean, everything. I think um, I think it was number six and number. Um, God, it's the other number. It might have been ten, but I, I know I know Dynamite was number six. But the point is that every show in front of it. Every single one was, um, you know, NBA and college basketball, nothing else. No, no other, you know, no other sports, no other entertainment. Um, Rampage was still like number two entertainment show of the night. So it was a very successful, you know, thing by, you know, whatever. Um, I still would say that, um, you know, a lot of people are looking at this with all the, the, the investment in the new stars and everything. And, you know, Mercedes's first appearance advertised um, after the the big one the week before. I mean, I think the clear thing is that that, um, you know, Mercedes is going to more be like Adam Copeland and Christian mm-hmm. coming over than CM Punk and Brian Danielson, and Adam Cole, who all moved numbers when they came in. She's going to be someone who. Is is for whatever reason, it's not like she's going to be this great draw, but she still can be a very effective part of the show. You know, I think that Christian's done remarkable work. I think Adam Copeland's done a great job, but they're not super draws. They're not game changers. They were in the main event. You know, I mean, it's like if you would, you know, like that, that I quit match. I had certainly thought that it would do a little bit better uh, the Wednesday show, just like it did the week before. The one that was surprised me was I thought that it would do a great number in Canada because it's Toronto and it's Adam Copeland and Christian, two Canadian stars in an I quit match to this finalizing this feud. And the Canadian number was a normal number. You know, it wasn't a bad number. It was just a normal number. And I thought that, that these two would, would um, increase that number. Um, so I think that the one thing is, is that like none of these people are going to be miracle workers when it comes to the ratings. The ratings are going to be what they're going to be. They may stay at this level forever. They may drop a little bit. Um, I mean, there's still great numbers as far as the Wednesday goes. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, um, I mean, I, I mean, I guess you could say like they, I look at it like, look, they had a great crowd in Boston. They had a great crowd in Toronto, but then I look at the advance. This is like, that would all be well and good and go, Hey, yeah, momentum, you know, this and that. But then I look at the advances in, those, in these other cities, and we're still – it's still in the same ballpark. And it's going to – you know, to turn this around or to get this hotter is going to be extremely difficult when WWE is strong. I mean, that's the one thing. I think as a number two group, they're doing actually fantastic. But, um, you know, um, 
it's not there's there's been very few places historically where a number two group was supported at a high level for anything for any length of time. It is a hard, hard position to be in. And they're doing as good in that position as almost anyone, but it's a hard position. I mean, I when when WWE became, you know, when it when when that period when WWE when when they, it, it's it's stopping a dogfight and WWE became the dominant group again as far as popularity went. Um I knew it was going to be really, really hard for AEW, no matter what they put on. And, you know, it's like people are going to me a lot now. And she's like, these shows have been great. Why isn't the number up? And it's like, because they're the number two group. You know, it's like if you are looking at this in the manner of, um, um, you know, a sports league, let's just say. Um, and in, you know, like, in, hey, we got the football league. So although well, they're, they're, that's a big, big, the gap between the NFL and the UFL is, is, is far bigger, but let's just say UF, UFC and what Bellator was or UFC and what PFL is now, obviously, if you compare them, AEW is a million times more popular than the number two league in MMA. Um, and that, and that's a similar thing. Um, but it's hard, like, like PFL signs, whoever, right? Francis Naganu. Are they going to start doing um, giant TV ratings with them? They're not. They're going to do their 300,000. I mean, that's the number they're going to be at. Um, when he fights, will it be higher? Yeah. But it's going to be UFC numbers. You know, and he, and he won't be on TV anyway. He'll be on pay-per-view. But it's <laughs> Francis Ngannou pay-per-view. My God. <laughs> did, 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 you know, we talked about it last week. But yeah. um, the one thing about that that did surprise me, and I have no idea why, is the percentage of people that bought the Francis Naganu pay-per-view with with Joshua on a Friday afternoon and the overlap with TNA Hard to Kill or, or TNA um there's TNA Hard to Kill right that was the name of the January show I think so yeah and I don't have any reason for it I mean I just wrote about it but it's like usually I can go like okay this is why I have no clue why there's this big crossover with TNA as compared to AEW or WWE got no idea i mean and it's in and among dish owners among dish owners i mean it was a freaking high correlation i mean it's like ridiculous and i saw those numbers and these are real numbers and it's like i have no idea why this is but it is and why would why would more people that are tna pay-per-view buyers um when it's which is far far smaller number than aew be buying francis naganu and uh anthony joshua weirdo boxing match yeah no idea you you would think a wrestling promoted boxing match like that was would be equatable to all wrestling and not just tna but who yeah. knows uh the do you sense that tony khan is trying to do a little bit better job of booking forward so that you can actually advertise some of these matches coming to your town because in the last three shows obviously big business had matches and this week i thought this week they they promoted the next show real well i thought they promoted actually on big business i thought they promoted this toronto show really well match really effective well. better than the big business show and 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 here's the other thing toronto in that last week sold a lot of tickets yeah it worked for the local you know um but but you know, th having said that, the rating change didn't change at all. It didn't change at all. Yeah, and, and and I guess for next week's show, while I don't think the matches are going to be it, as well, big. Well, well as, far, as far as the rating, it was a much harder night. I mean, that's the one thing. So it's like, yeah, it, it didn't really change. Um, but it was a it was a much harder night. But you know, again, with wrestling, you know, the, your your competition absolutely matters. It absolutely does. But. You know, your product matters more than your, your competition, so to speak. So I was, you know, I, I expected a um I expected a higher rating for the two hours. And in the third hour, like I said, the drop at ten fifteen was 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 pretty big. I mean more still, than still it, still a pretty decent amount higher than they would get on a Friday night though. Oh, way higher. Way higher. And the first, you know, the drop was not at ten and it was not at ten oh five when the edge match ended. Because the first match the first match on um on um on on the rampage show did very well but it was after that then there was like this big drop do you think had they booked it and advertised it as a three-hour dynamite instead they would have held that third hour better yes 
That's it. Well, you know, the one thing when, when you're comparing this, because Raw is three hours every week. When you're comparing this to Raw, with Raw, the show builds and peaks with the main event, which is the last match on the show, and they spend two hours building it. And this one, they did tell you at the beginning, hey, these women are going to be in a street fight. They did shoot the angle, you know, for this street fight. They did talk about it. But the difference was that it was Julia Hart and Sky Blue against Willow Nightingale and Chris Statlander. It was not Cody Rhodes and Jey Uso against, you know, um, Judgment Day, just, just throwing something out. And that's the difference in the sense of WWE, even though the third hour is going to be the lowest hour almost every week, WWE still puts builds a show around you know they're, they're really now if you really notice they're always going at 9 p.m with something big and it's usually a, an interview with cody rhodes um but you know but a, a major interview at nine and probably another one at 10 um with the top stars but the big match the biggest match of the show is always at 10 45 and with this one it was like yeah you put on a street fight and the women worked really hard and everything but you know it's like um, one of the things that I think is, is a weakness of AEW, a big weakness when it comes to the television, is that they put people who are not main eventers in main events. And this is what happens when you do that. People are not going to stick around for non-main eventers, no matter how hard they work and no matter how many thumbtacks you do and, and, and all that. Um, they're not, you know, they're, they're not main eventers. You know, you only have a couple of main eventers and they're usually put on early. And with that, you're always going to fade. I know, and that's what happened. Um, I mean, it's, you know, given the opposition and everything on the night and what everything else did the night, I mean, it was, they did well, but, um, but yeah, I didn't, I, that, that, I didn't like that 10, 15 drop. That was, um, you know, even though WWE has a 10, 15 drop too, uh, you know, every Monday, it's, it's not as severe. And the reason it's not as, it's not as severe, even though it's, it's significant is because they always leave you with that big match at the end. And this one, it was like, yeah, they had a great match. You know, I mean, they, they worked really, really hard and everything, but they're not main eventers. Sky Blue in the main eventer, you know, it's like, um, it's just they they were Julia, Julia Hart's not a main eventer, not yet. And in maybe the, yet. in the opening segment, though, they were the uh, silent assassins who got outmaneuvered by the one baby face in the middle of the ring. Yes, yeah, because it was the Mercedes thing. I think that they probably did that to make people think Mercedes was going to come in at the end, which she didn't. No. So. Here's another thing about Mercedes, and I know we're only two weeks in, so you know we need a, a, a long time to sort of figure out uh, how she is as a star. But I thought it was a little peculiar. So two weeks in a row, she's the opening segment. And we know, coming from whatever the lead-in is, that first 15 minutes is like the peak of the show as far as the total audience is. Yeah, the lead didn't really suck this week. I will say that. Well, well um, I don't even know what it was. Uh, 0.16. I mean, the week before was 0.23, I think. It was way, way – it was down 31% from, from the week before. But, I mean, it's still, it's still a lot of – it's still a lot of women. It's still a lot of over 50s that, that are not going to – that are going to be there for, for the first, you know, few minutes of Dynamite – that won't be there for the rest of the show. The 18 to 49 guys, it's not really, you know, very often, probably more often than not, it's not the first quarter, most, most of the times. But but with over 50, you most of your, you're going to have more over 50 viewers in the first 15 minutes of Dynamite every week. Yes. But I just find it peculiar anyway. that if that is your biggest segment now, as you know, like you just said, they may not be the, the loyal audience. They put Mercedes out there to the most amount of eyeballs. And yet they did not, give her any concrete plans to say if you want to see her wrestle it's going to be this you know this time or who is going to be her first opponent like they didn't like lock any of that stuff in no and people will say well if you're following if you're watching you have an idea i'm like great yeah that's that's great but you had the opportunity well, she, she 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 talked about willow she really did so she, we 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 didn't have a did. time or a place, but she talked about Willow. <laughs> yeah, I would, but I would have loved to know, you know, when when is that match happening? Absolutely. Or, or, or what's the beef? Or you know, tell us, you what's know, the this story a little bit more. I you know always, we saw the video. She pointed to the Titan Tron. You know, that was her. That was her thing. But I don't know. I just I found I find the whole thing to be like, yay, we have this star, and then I am after I watched those segments, I go, okay, well, what did we do with that time? I don't think that they really used that time very wisely. I agree with you completely. 
I agree with you completely. There's the direction isn't strong enough. Um, and the other thing I felt, and again, it's early and it doesn't, you know, in the long run, if, if she is the wrestler that she was and has the matches that she had before, um, she will become very, very popular in this company unless she does something to rub people the wrong way. Um, because it is an audience that does want to see good matches. And she certainly was like, if she has the match, if she consistently has the match, like she had with Stephanie Vacare, just to throw that one out there. Or or Kyrie Sane in San Jose, which was probably even which was even a better match. If she has matches like that, you know, um, she's going to be at least, if nothing else, a big, um, you know, a, a big help to the company. Mm-hmm. And 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 she may again. I don't know. Like like she moves around fine, but it's still we haven't seen her in a wrestling match, so we don't know. You know, and it was a devastating injury. I mean, is she going to be able to come off the top rope and land on her feet? I don't know. Um, and that's like the stuff that, that the jury is out on. And in the long run, even if, you know, she was like super, super popular, if, if the injuries are so much, it, 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 it'd be difficult for her. So we, it's like the jury's totally out. I did think that the segment was very WWE ish, which is not necessarily a bad thing. If it's the only WWE ish thing on the show, I just thought, you know, again, watching it, it was just so weird to me. I watched this Mercedes segment and then I watched the Will Ospreay segment later. And it was just like, these are two different products. They're just different. Like Will Ospreay is doing something, which is kind of like what Cody Rhodes is doing. And Mercedes is doing something like what WWE kind of did with the pose and this and that, you know, like, like it's not, this. it's just not the same thing. Um, Not to say that, that one is bad, but one didn't, it didn't hook me. I'll say that. Uh, But it's again, you know, I, I I think most likely her first match should be on the pay per view April twenty first. I wouldn't put it on TV. Um, you know, you could argue to put it on TV, but I'm going to guess the way Tony works, he's going to put the first match on pay per view, which would be I'm going to guess Julia Hart or Willow Nightingale. Um, you know, if, I, if they I now- enjoy I enjoy both of them uh, as performers. It just kind of boggles my mind that it's not for Baker. Well, if she's, if, available. if she's available, but but just the fact that or Tony Storm because she's a champion. How how long ago did you think you knew that there was a very good chance that Mercedes was coming into AEW? Well, certainly August, right? Yeah, she's I mean, on there. She's, 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 she's on. The, she's on the show, and even before that, I thought that there was. I always thought there was a chance. Um, she, see, you had seven months to build somebody up for her. Well, Tony Storm would be the one. She's the one who's been getting the focal point of all the attention. Yeah. So um, maybe, and 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 it, it feels like they're not going to rush into that direction. Maybe they're going to save that one for like a Wembley, mm-hmm. and they're going to go with uh, Julia Hart first, or a Willow first, or give her the TBS title first, and then you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you just have to see how, um, you know, the jur- the jury's out, and her performances in in the end, her performance and her promos when when it comes time to promoting a match as opposed to just here I'm here and I'm so happy to be here which is fine because I mean Will was the same way but Will's the same way I'm so happy to be here but I've also got this match with Brian Danielson coming yeah you know which which is which is the difference she has to now switch into I got this match with whoever like Will Ospreay did and then we'll see what you know you know we'll see what what she's got all right, a couple more questions, and then we have some from the uh, listeners. Terry Gordy, Dark Side of the Ring. I know you watched it. I was thinking as I was watching this show, obviously he was very – he made all you know a lot of his money, most of his money in Japan. That was the, the, the place that he was you – know, that, that he was over, and, and he was a star there. But it made me wonder, what stopped WCW or – WWF at the time from seeing him as a possible singles star. Cause around that time frame, we're talking 91, 92, 93 in 92, you're kind of post Hogan and then Brett and Brett has like no contenders. And I was just wondering like, was Terry Gordy ever considered to be like, Hey, you know, we need to, we need to bring this guy in and, and he was making he, too much. He was making too much in Japan. You know, you got to remember that those guys in Japan were were the Japan job, the all Japan job in that period. If you had it was 
like, yes, there were guys that were making more money, but this was a guaranteed thing. You know, it's guaranteed money. It's not like, well, you can make this or this. And granted, with WCW, you know, the, some guys could make more. But um, I, I don't know. I just know the guys that, that were, were – I mean, the physical toll of that All Japan period was really tough. But I know from talking to the different guys that were there, um, it was like there's no place they would rather be. You know, it's like they – they weren't looking. Now, when their body started betraying them, in in every case, it's like let's just get to WWE. <laughs> you know what I mean? Now, now I understand the business historically has been you know, all about the money. It's yeah. it's only about the money. But I mean, but the, but the, the other key is, is that you make a lot per week, and you have a lot of time off. Like you can. That was the one thing where um, where where like the guys who work Japan, it's like. They would always tell me, it's like, we're not on a 52-week thing. It's like, it's hard. We do three hard weeks. It's it's not stressful in Japan. You know, you're not driving to a city and, you know, renting a hotel and buying, you know, everything's taken care of. You're on a luxury bus. You're on a nice bus. You're in a nice hotel in most cases when you're with All Japan. Um, you're getting big money. You're on network television. You're you're treated like you're a superstar. You're not, you know what I mean. You're not treated like you're, you know, whatever, like a funky or whatever. It's a it's a good thing. It's very, but it's very hard. I mean, the mentality used to be that like we work our ass off, but we got a couple of weeks off in between to recharge. What we've learned, you know, in AEW, I think we've learned it too, is that that's not necessarily the best thing because what happens is on that last night when you go, I got I got three weeks off. You go out there and do so much. <laughs> And, and yeah, because you know, you have three weeks off that you wouldn't do if you knew you had to wrestle the next day, but all, you know, the, the, you know, the long term of those all Japan guys was, was not as good, was not, was not that good. And that's why I'm afraid of AEW because, you know, with AEW, you know, you, we watch some of the matches and the risks are there because those guys are going like, I don't have to wrestle again for another two weeks. Um, And you do a lot more than you would do if you had to wrestle the next day. So um, you know, but, but as far as like, why with Terry Gordy, you know, it was that, that all Japan job was, it was, was considered like the plum job in wrestling because time off, you know, weeks off with your family between tours and but he had to though, zonk himself out to fly to Japan. Yeah. He didn't like the, you know, I mean, it's funny, you know, watching that, all the different thoughts that I had, um, from the little bit that I was around him and which was not a lot, but it was in Japan. And um, I was there when he bought his first video recorder. You know that? Oh, wow. He he went to the, um, um, was it, you know, the electronics district. I remember he was the middle of the tour. He went to this electronics district and he came back and he had this, this video camera, high tech, you know, like way better than they had in the United States and probably for a better price. Mm -hmm. And he's running around the hotel and he's filming, you know, me and lots of other people <laughs> and, and he's just having the time. It's just like a little kid or big kid. I mean, he's a big kid, but having the time of his life, you know, um, it's, it's like when I think about like him, it's, it's, uh, it's sad. Um, it's really sad. Um, yeah. cause he was a real, he was, a, he was a real talent, but yeah, like, like I said, like I was with Fumi that one night and, um, right before the tour, the first day of the tour started and, you know, some of the guys were out there and it's like, you know, Fumi wanted to see Terry because I think Fumi and Terry were good friends and it's just like oh but it's the first day you know the day after the flight you just leave Terry alone mm -hmm. because he's he's so he's so zonked and it broke my heart with those that Steve Williams interview where he's talking about like this happened all the time yeah. but he would like he would be zonked out and then Steve Williams would slap him in the face and everything and wake him up and then this time on the, the bad one he was doing it and he wasn't getting up and then he start you know CPR and everyone's panicking and um, how long was he doing that until they touched down? I don't know. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know the time frame. I don't think it was super long because if it was, you know, if it was, um, somewhere, you know, they could have, it, it was before Hawaii, they were probably touched down in Hawaii. You yeah. Know what I mean, but, um, you know, the, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was like, you know, hour or hours or what um yeah i just remember the i mean all i really heard is that he's in a coma and mm -hmm. i was like what and it's like he's in a coma and um we were i didn't have the impression he was going to die but maybe that's because they were keeping it so secretive 
and and it wasn't really out big it was like it's not like it was news like in japan or anything like that it was it was very much this wrestler told this wrestler who told me it's like terry's in a coma right you know you know that's how it kind of got through and then it's kind of like all japan you know would kind of do the statement oh you know he's he's gonna miss this tour that's all they said it's mm-hmm. not like he's hospitalized it's life or death you know nothing like that just like Terry is something happened. He's going to miss this tour. And then he just, you know, didn't come back for a while. And then when he came back, he, you know, he just couldn't go anymore. It was really, really sad. Uh, last thing for me, and then we'll get to the couple questions. I haven't seen a lot about this. Uh, Bellator signing a deal to be on Max. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen any numbers about if they get paid, if it's some know. sort of. I heard maybe barter like deal or something. I don't know. I don't I don't know any whatever. I don't know what kind of it was. All I know is that the deal wasn't announced until like days before, which I didn't think was good. And then they announced the fight network deal for Canada and then Virgin media in, I believe it's Ireland, you know, all at the last minute. So yeah, I don't like the library is up there. So that's gotta be worth something. Yeah. Yeah. They got a good library. Yeah, that's true. Um, but um, yeah, it's this afternoon was the first show, and it was you know it was uh, you know an okay show. I didn't see it, but I mean it's I'm we're doing this head to yeah. head. <laughs> um, okay, questions from listeners uh, from Mel. The last two years, AEW Dynamite has had Detroit shows in June, the uh, 2022 Blood and Guts, and the post Forbidden Door uh, show, which was their debut. Um, there have been lots of Midwest dates announced, but no Detroit dates. Do you know if AEW is coming back to be to Detroit uh, for pay per view or I don't know. a TV show? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, from Jose, in the wake of AEW trying to find a ratings draw, and uh, it's notable to me that one of the few reliable ratings movers they have is Kenny Omega as a singles competitor. Mm-hmm. If Kenny comes back and he seems at least somewhat healthy, would you roll the dice on him as champion again? I don't know how much credit Dave gives him for AEW business when he was champion in 2021, but I, mean, I figure it's worth the, the, consideration. The, the pay-per-views definitely grew up with, with him as champion. Um I, you know, there's so many factors, you know, what his body can hold up to, um, his health situation. I couldn't even make a, 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 you know, if he, you know, I don't even like know when, if he's coming back, there's, there's too many variables to give a good answer to that. If he is a hundred percent and this time off, um, heals him up because time off is a great thing for him, um, as far as healing up. And it is for for all injuries. I mean, you know, you think you have an injury that's that's never going away, and you take a year off, and then all of a sudden, you know, you might be doing okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's happened with a lot of a lot of guys. So it just depends on how his physical conditioning, um, and who else is there. You know, there's just there's like again, a lot of different variables. You know, I mean, another another thing that they're missing is is Max. I mean, Max was Max was their biggest ratings draw. Um, you know, and and he's gone, and again, and he's keeping everything a secret. You know, whatever's going on with him, man, I I don't hear a thing past that. You know, he has a shoulder injury, I know that, and he just celebrated his birthday, I know that too. But you know what I mean? It's like <laughs> I don't know. You know, nobody's talking about him, and um, so, but but he's he's an, he's another one. Um, as far as yeah, being uh being ring straw, and the pay per views did well with him too when he was on top. The pay per views when when he was. When he was doing that tag team thing in the mid card, they didn't do as well. Yeah. All right. Last one from Moxley Mayhem 22. What is the difference between the wrestling that CMLL showcases compared to AAA? In other words, what are some of the key philosophical differences? They're just so different. Um, I mean, CMLL does week to week booking. Um, very traditional, you know, you pin the champion in a trios match, you get a championship match, you know, you have, um, you know, long-term storylines with the same people and stuff like that. Um, you have a certain style, which is kind of like the house style. Um, and it's a style that really appeals to tourists because that's a lot of their audience. And it's, it's not traditional, but it is in the sense of the psychology is traditional, but the moves are, are 2024. I mean, when I watch CMLL, the, the, 
the best thing about CML to me is that I'm watching, I feel like I'm in a 1975 arena um, in my childhood while watching my 2024 wrestling, which is really a, a fun experience to have. Um, AAA is, is um, just a lot of wildness and stuff, and the wrestling's not always that good. And, um, you know, some of the characters are over. Um, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's not clicking right now, but they, um, some, you know, they, sometimes like they'll have the, the young guys and they're really, you know, they're really, really good, but they, it's, it's hard to elevate for whatever reason, because they, they, um, you know, they, they've got their certain audience and, you know, like the guys who are the biggest stars in AAA or like when they bring in, you know, Vampiro or Wagner or, or L.A. Park, who is not coming back this year, but Wagner's just coming back. They got Negro Casas, um, Alberto. You know what I mean? It's like it's very much – I mean, this whole year for AAA, I mean, they basically said it's all about nostalgia for the past. Um, and granted, I mean, CML has the same thing with Atlantis and Blue Panther, but they're also in a certain – you know, and, and guys like that, but they're also in a certain position. I mean, like the, the, the CMLL top guy, you know – I mean, they're really developing. I mean, yes, you got Mystico, of course, but you've got Mosca Dorada, you've got um, um, Sobrano Jr., you've got um, 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 Atlantis Jr. I mean, there's just like a lot of a lot of younger guys on the way up, and you see them rise. And with with AAA, it's very much uh, relying on the other stuff. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of weapons, broken tables, you know, EC, a lot, a lot of um, ECW, CZW, you know, the real hardcore stuff. Which CML doesn't do at all. I mean, CML has got this this um, lucha libre, and AAA is is not so much lucha libre. It's more, um, um, you know, post post ECW ECW deathmatch stuff mm -hmm. with lots of blood and lots of tables, and not necessarily the best wrestling in 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 and stuff and names from the past. And um, yeah, they're 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 so different. I mean, I think that that. Um, you know, and they have different different goals. CMLs, you know, which is funny because CMLL has always been the one that's just content to be CMLL and run their Arena Mexico shows and nothing else. And yet, for whatever reason, because they're hot is the reason. Um, a lot of the promoters in the United States, whether it's AEW or MLW, that really pay attention to this, this scene, they want to bring their guys in. AAA was much more aggressive about getting the guys work in the United States. But then it kind of backfired because then the guys that they got working in the United States didn't really want to work for AAA because the money wasn't as big. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, you know, I don't know. I mean, they're just um, – they're, they're, they're so different. I mean, if you want to see what I would call, you know, the, 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 the Lucha Libre, that's, that's CMLL. If you want to see um, the blood and guts and, um, you know, a wide variety of styles – you know, because you'll get you'll get your you'll get your high flying on the scene on a, on a triple A show. You'll get that, but you also get a lot of um, nostalgia um, and a lot of um, a lot of brawling and blood. You know, which you're not going to get on the CML show. So it's just a matter of um, taste. And you know, there were times when when triple A was doing better, and right now CMLL is 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 very much the in thing in a lot of ways. You know, I mean, as far as drawing, um, because the tourists and everything, they're so tourist friendly. You know, they're drawing better than anyone but WWE, really, right now. All right. That is it. You and Brian will be back on Sunday night with another Wrestling Observer Radio. And are you coming on with Andrew and I on We're Live Pal on Tuesday? Yes. Okay. That's the plan. That's the plan. Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And it is not behind the members only YouTube channel. It is live on the F4W uh, YouTube channel, the regular version. Uh, and Dave is going to answer super chat questions. So if you've ever had a question that didn't have to do with how many Ultimate Warriors were there, come and come through to We're Live Pal and, uh, and you can get your question answered. All right. So 